Welcome folks here in the Verkehrshaus der Schweiz, or Swiss Museum of Transport as it can be translated to English, in Lucerne, where we have the most classic exhibit of any museum related to railways in any way. A steam locomotive which is cut open on one side so you can see how it works on the inside. As mind-bogglingly complicated as this construction may appear on first sight, its basic working principle actually is very simple. But that is the thing that I like about steam locomotives. Because as Sergei Korolyov, the leading engineer of the Soviet space program, once said, the simpler a machine is, the more ingenious it is. Everybody can over-engineer things. And the ingenious simplicity of some Soviet space hardware is a good idea for a future video, by the way. But uh, anyway, let's stay on topic. So over the next few minutes, I always surprise myself by how long my videos actually get. We are going to discuss, uh, to discuss the various systems of the steam locomotive here. I have selected this one for my video because it is arranged in such a way that the wheels can move so you can see the function of the cylinders and the valve here, but unfortunately it was out of order for, the, for some reason on the day when I visited. But this locomotive has another special feature which adds a bit of complexity to it but also makes it particularly interesting. And if you are a bit familiar with steam locomotives you might have noticed it already and we are going to discuss it at the end of the video. But before we begin, would I like to mention that I'm not a professional. I once wrote on the footplate of a steam locomotive. You can watch the full video of that with the information card in the top right corner. This is also the place where I'm going to link the other videos which are used in this video. And anyway, I took that foot, uh, footplate, by the footplate right, excuse me, once and helped in the workshop of that Heritage Railway a few times. But I'm actually more familiar with ships and I'm confident enough in my technical knowledge to make this short video which doesn't go too much into detail. Plus this is YouTube, everybody pretends to know things here. But if I say anything wrong or inaccurate you can feel free to let me know in the comments. I would highly appreciate that. With that being said we can now start to look into the transition of coal and water into mechanical energy at the furnace or firebox to use the locomotive specific term and more precisely at the bottom where with the grate where the coal burns and below that grate at the ash pen or ash pen are air flaps which are hidden on this locomotive but well visible on the sides of other locomotives and these air flaps can be adjusted by the stoker to control the airflow into the fire and the grate itself is specifically designed for the fuel that burns so you could not put wood or turf on this grate which is designed to burn coal Temperatures in the firebox exceed 1000 degrees Celsius or 1832 degrees Fahrenheit. So everything and particularly the grate has to be heat resistant. Hence this grate here is made of cast iron but others may consist of small tubes which are filled with boiler water and thus cooled from the inside. And for the same reason the firebox is suspended inside the boiler with these uh, stud bolts which you can see right now to keep it surrounded by water at all times because if it wasn't surrounded by water the metal would get so hot and thus so weak that the boiler could explode and to prevent that two fusible plugs are placed in the crown sheet the uppermost part of the firebox which would be the first thing to run dry and uh, these fusible plugs would melt before the firebox itself overheats and they only act as a last means of safety because if they melt the steam would blow off into the firebox and thus extingu uh, extinguish the fire. But I wouldn't want to be near that when, some, when this happens and particularly not when the, um, the fire door is open. But this uh, scenario definitely is better than the, uh, the boiler going boom. The hot smoke gas then passes through this set of pipes here in the middle of the boiler the so-called fire tubes and they have the simple purpose of maximizing the surface area through which heat can be transferred to the boiler water and thus increase efficiency if you can even speak of that with steam locomotives as they barely reach 10% which means of 100 kilograms of coal, uh, coal they burn only 10 of them will actually tow your train and the other 90s are just waste heat that escapes through the funnel or the chimney. The fire tubes could also be in danger of bursting if lime scale builds up on them. Because steam locomotives have an open water cycle, more on that later, they usually run on normal tap water instead of distilled water like stationary or marine steam engines would. 
And to reduce lime scale, the feed water is treated with additives that turn lime and other minerals that are dissolved in the water into a sludge acid uh, that dissipates with heat and then accumulates at the bottom of the boiler and can be disposed with a boiler blowdown. These fire tubes then end in the so-called smoke box at the forward end of the boiler, from which the smoke gas then gets exhausted through the chimney. And below the chimney is a blast pipe which uses the exhaust steam to blow the fire, but we are going to talk about that later in a little more detail. And above the blast pipe is also is a spark arrestor in the form of that flat black mesh structure at the number 7, and other designs may also have a cylindrical one like this locomotive here where you can also see the fire tubes very nicely. This footage here shows very nicely why such a spark arrestor is important, because as impressive as this may look here in the Sandao Ling coal mine in northern China, we don't want such a firework show next to a field with straw or a dry forest in summertime. The Sandao Ling coal mine was the last place in the world where steam locomotives operated commercially until 2018, as the mine will close in a few years. And the user ISO 8 TV was friendly enough to allow me to use footage from his video, which is linked here in the top right corner, and I highly recommend you to watch it. I obviously already used it for the boiler blowdown, but that clip just was too short to give any credit. And while it unquestionably is something to be appreciated that coal mining and generally the use of coal are declining now as their environmental impact becomes intolerable, the steam locomotives operating in the extremely cold moonscape of northern, uh, northern China certainly are a sight to be missed. Having produced our steam at a sufficient pressure, typically 12 to 16 bar, or 174 to 232 psi, we have to collect it from the boiler. And for that purpose, it is fitted with the so-called steam dome on top of it. And as we all know, boiling water is bubbling and gushing around, but we don't want to get any liquid water into our steam engine. So the steam dome allows to place the steam collecting pipe at a greater distance to the water surface in the boiler. And next to the number 3 is the regulator valve, which acts as the throttle by controlling how much steam gets into the steam chest of the cylinders. And it is operated by the rod at number 4, which connects it to the regulator lever on the footplate. And on top of the steam dome also are two safety valves to prevent boiler explosions from exceeding the working pressure, and the steam whistle also is typically placed there. As of now, the steam still contains millions of microscopic water drops which make it visible, just like from a kettle. And the so-called saturated steam then usually is let into a superheater, where it gets heated well beyond its saturation temperature, which would be 198 degrees at 15 bar, to 300 and more degrees. This is achieved by leading the steam through lots of superheater pipes which run inside the fire tubes, but I don't see any of that here as the steam goes straight from the dome to the cylinders. And superheated steam, you may have guessed it, would significantly increase power and efficiency. The steam then goes into the steam chests of each cylinder. And inside the steam chest is the so-called slide valve, which controls to which side of the piston the steam will go, to push it through the cylinder while steam is exhausted on the other side of the piston. And it would be very helpful if the locomotive moved like it is supposed to, but it didn't for some reason, like I already said before. And as an alternative arrangement, I found this video here of a nice model, and as usual you can watch it with the link in the top right corner. And the high pressure steam then comes from the boiler and goes into the red steam chest above the cylinder, where it goes around the slide valve and through these two small red channels into the cylinder, forcing the piston to the side. And the steam on the other side of the piston is pus uh, pushed out through this, um, pushed out of the cylinder through the small channels, the same which it entered, and then passes underneath the slide valve and goes into the blast pipe in the smoke box. The two cylinder covers are equipped with drainage cocks, which get opened when starting the locomotive, even if it was standing only for, uh, only for a minute. And the reason is that the cylinders cool down in that time, which causes the steam to condensate inside. And this condensate could cause the engine to hydrolock, so the drainage cocks allow the condensate to escape the cylinders. And furthermore, the um, cylinder pressure can also be measured there, which is why these drainage cocks are also known as indicator cocks. 
the piston force then gets transferred to the crosshead by the piston rod. A connecting rod is attached to the crosshead which turns the reciprocating piston movement into a rotational movement at the wheel. The reason that the connecting rod is attached to a crosshead and not directly to the piston like it would be in a small internal combustion engine is that it would only allow a single acting piston as it couldn't be sealed, unlike the piston rod here which is sealed with a stuffing box. A guide shoe maintains a parallel movement of piston and crosshead without force on the stuffing box. So after the connecting rod transferred the power to one wheel, it then is distributed to all driving wheels, three in this case here, by the coupling rod. If you compare the wheels on both sides of the locomotive, you can see that the crank pins are offset by 90 degrees to each other. The so-called quartering allows the engine to be self-starting from any position. Crank pins offset by 180 degrees, like in an internal combustion engine, would be the best layout in terms of engine vibrations, but would also cause both pistons to be in their dead center simultaneously, and the engine couldn't be started from that position. A 90 degree offset causes the other piston to be exactly between the dead centers if one of the, if the other piston, or if the first piston is in one of them. And between the two dead centers is the position with the highest torque because the connecting rod is almost rectangular to the crank. Attached to the crank pin of the wheel, which is driven directly by the connecting rod, is an eccentric which is offset 90 degrees to the position of the crank pin. And it moves a set of other rods which in terms operates the sliding valve inside the steam chest of the cylinder. And the so-called valve gear can be adjusted from the footplate in order to reverse the engine. And this locomotive here is equipped with a Balsherz valve gear which is the most common type in steam locomotives and others include the Stevenson Slink, which is common in marine steam engines, while stationary steam engines often use a separate valve, uh, valve shaft and poppet valve, like the ones you also find in internal combustion engines. The valve gear doesn't just allow reversing the engine, but also adjusting the valve timing, because contrary to popular belief, is the steam not just injected into the cylinder for the whole stroke length, as this would result in with the um, excuse me in the steam being exhausted at the exact same pressure with which it left the boiler, and thus losing a lot of energy. And instead, the slide valve opens the intakes only for a brief moment before closing them again and then allowing the steam to expand inside the cylinder, which then turns the pressure and temperature into mechanical work. And this increases the efficiency at the cost of power. And then the valve gear allows to adjust the valve timing depending on the demand. So if you need a lot of torque, like when starting or when going uphill, you can set up the valve timing to inject a lot of steam, which then again is exhausted still at pressure, which results in this loud and hard chuffing, noi uh, chuffing sound that you hear when a steam locomotive is going uphill or when it is starting. But when you then have reached the speed you want, you can um, reduce the steam or the valve timing, you can reduce the opening of the intake ports, which then reduces the amount of steam injected. This reduces the steam and thus coal consumption and makes the chuffing sound from the exhaust qui uh, much quieter and softer. And you may have noticed that I'm showing a different model now than I did before, because the first one may be better in terms of craftsmanship, uh, craftsmanship, but this one shows much better how the slide valve cycle changes. And I have taken it from a video which explains the different parts of the Walshert uh, valve gear in much greater detail, and I once again recommend you to watch it in the top right corner. But what I can show you here is the valve gear wheel on the footplate and a wheel is used because the valve gear is quite heavy and thus moved by a spindle. Like all the footplate footage are also these images here from a different locomotive. The one with the open smoke box we've seen before. The footplate of the cutaway locomotive we are discussing most of the time is inaccessible for visitors and the rod connecting the valve gear spindle to the expansion link is hidden behind the water tanks because this locomotive is a tank engine which has the coal bunker and water tanks on board instead of towing them on a tender behind. And this other locomotive is displayed over a pit so you can walk underneath it where you can see two more connecting rods between the wheels because this locomotive has two more cylinders hidden inside. And this is somewhat common with high performance mainline locomotives, uh, locomotives 
and some of them had compound steam engine with two inner high pressure cylinders and two outer low pressure cylinders. But I'm planning to talk about compound steam engines in a future, uh, future video. High performance mainline and four cylinders are the keywords to come to the special feature of this locomotive here. Because as a narrow gauge locomotive it isn't exactly mainline or high performance, while maybe some Swiss narrow gauge railways look a bit like mainline. But um, it indeed has four cylinders, and the reason to that is that the upper two of them are powering that uh, blind shaft above the drive wheels. And like I say, you may have noticed that already, that there are two more cylinders and that there is this blind shaft. And the reason to all of that is that this locomotive was used on a rack railway, the Fulker Mountain Pass, which is a heritage railway that still sees steam locomotives daily until today. Or at least in summertime, uh, in summertime, because it is closed in winter because of the inherent uh, danger of avalanches at over two kilometers of altitude. And rack railways allow trains to climb very steep gradients of up to 48% in case of the extremely steep Pilatus railway, which also is in Switzerland. This is possible by using a rack and pinion system, as the name suggests, instead of just the friction between wheel and rail because steel on steel is slippery. And the Fulker Railway consists partially of rack segments, while most of the tracks are just a normal friction railway. And hence, this locomotive here needs two different types of propulsion to run using friction or using the rack on steeper sections. And the cockwheel for the rack can't just be bolted to the axles of the normal wheels because it has to be synchronized with the rack when entering a rack section. And depending on what exact rack system is used, there are different ones like Riggenbach, Abt or Locher, does the cogwheel also spin at a different speed than the normal wheels. But this whole topic about how and why to build a rack railway is a good idea for a future video. You can tell me in the comments whether you or not you would like to be, uh, whether or not you are interested. Pure rack locomotives like this one from the Fitznau Rigibahn don't need a second steam engine to power the normal wheels as they are driven by the cogwheel at all times. And the Fitznau Rigibahn was the first rack, ra uh, rack railway in Europe and the second one in the world, opening only shortly after the Mount Washington Cog Railway in America in 1871. And back then, the engineers were so concerned about the water level dropping below the crown sheet of the firebox that they fitted the first rack locomotive with vertical boilers to reduce the risk of boiler explosions. And while a vertical boiler locomotive is on static display at uh, um, is on static display at the Mount Washington Cock Railway, this one here is scheduled to return to Fitznau in 2021 to push trains up to the Rigi Mountain once again. And it quickly became apparent that this wasn't really necessary to fit uh, vertical boilers. So all later rack locomotives just had horizontal boilers fitted and it fitted at an angle. But I just can't skip on showing this rail car from the extremely steep Pilatus Railway, which has a horizontal boiler mounted sideways, because that's the only way to fit it into this funicular-like uh, car. And while they were replaced in 1937 by the electric rail cars we see there until today, one of them was kept operational until the 80s, and I don't know why it then was withdrawn from historic service but it certainly would be nice to see one of the two preserved ones. The other is in the Deutsches Museum in Munich, uh, Munich, München, steaming again. Last but not least are we coming back to the cutaway locomotive to discuss some of the auxiliaries there. And the first thing is the cylinder oil pump, which is driven by yet another rod attached to the wheels. And um, the wheel bearings are lubricated using wicks, while the bearings on the various ruts of the steam engine use quite a clever system of grommets and needles, which is a bit too small to show it here. But the German TV channel N um, NDR has done a very good documentary about a heritage railway on the island Rügen, where this is explained at 21 minutes and 45 seconds into the video. And you can watch that video with the link in the top right corner and English subtitles are available. Next up are the injectors, which feed water from the water tank into the boiler. They use the Bernoulli principle to accelerate the feed water to supersonic speed with steam from the boiler, before turning that speed into pressure by slowing it down again. 
And it is possible to reach higher injecting pressures than the boiler pressure at which the steam entered the injector because the feed water, being a liquid, can't be compressed and thus the energy which would have been turned into compression heat becomes pressure again. And they require cold feed water which then has to be heated up in the boiler. Some locomotives have feed water preheaters to increase efficiency, but they may require steam driven feed water pumps like this duplex pump on the steamship Bussard. And the blast pipe in the smoke box also works by the Benry principle, but creates suction to cause a draw through the firebox instead of pressure in the chimney. And the last thing we are discussing in detail is the air compressor. And compressed air is required for the brakes and produced with a simplex, com a simplex compressor, a single cylinder free piston engine, which basically means a crankless steam engine with the compressor piston directly attached to the steam piston. And it doesn't need any valve gear because the engine is single acting, so the steam pressure only, push, uh, only pushes it in one direction and then it is pushed back by the air pressure in the compressor cylinder. And because it is a single cylinder, it is not self-starting, unlike the related duplex pump that we've seen a minute ago. And that's why the compressor, uh, compressor has to be started manually and is, or it keeps idling when the air bottles are full, causing one of the typical steam locomotive sounds. And when the when it is filling up the empty air bottles after breaking, it is pumping much quicker. And these two brass levers talking about brakes in on the footplate next to the valve gear wheel are the valves for controlling the two different brakes. One is for the locomotive and the other one is for the train behind. So all that's left for me to say now is uh, thank you for watching and props to your attention span if you made it to here through over 20 minutes of video. And you can feel free to like, share and subscribe. You can subscribe in the top right corner once these end screen clicky thingies come up. And in the top left corner you can see my latest upload. And at the bottom you can see the recommended videos with the left one being recommended by the YouTube algorithm and the right one being, uh, being recommended by me.